So I'm just super honored to be here. And I think the room knows you as the business titan, the CEO of YouTube, the person who ran Google Ads for a number of years. Um, I know you as an inspirational leader, as a culture builder. Um, but take us back. Take us back to being a young person deciding to go to business school. What happened? What brought you to UCLA? So 25 years ago, <laughs> actually more, right? 27. <laughs> 27 years ago. Um, yeah, I thought I'd go to business school because it seemed like the right thing to do. Because I saw that there were lots of people in consulting that had a lot of skills that I didn't always seem to have. Um, and UCLA was actually the only business school I got into. Um, and I actually got in off the wait list. So thank you for admitting me. I was very grateful for that. And I saw, I saw back then that there was going to be this incredible fusion of entertainment and tech and, enter and media and technology. And it was all going to come together. And I thought it was all going to come together in LA. And I would be here at UCLA and it would come together. And when I got here, I realized that a lot of the entertainment companies didn't quite have that vision yet. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, they might have seen some of the technology that was evolving more as a threat than they would have seen it as an opportunity. So I still believe that opportunity and it's, it's now come to fruition. And, and UCLA is in an incredible spot to be able to to take advantage and work with companies in the, in the media and entertainment space. But that was what I was thinking. And um, I initially, actually after graduation, went to Intel. Um, and I discovered relatively quickly that semiconductor technology, although it's really interesting, was just not a fit for me. <laughs> and, and we had to be there at 8 AM. And I'm not a morning person either. <laughs> and so that was just not a good fit. <laughs> um, and I saw that the internet was happening. It was happening all around us. It later crashed um, just a year after I entered it. But I, um, and so a lot of, for a lot of people, it seemed at the time like it had been more of a fad. But I, I really saw that this, it was a big trend that was going to happen and it was important to be a part of it. And so I was also pregnant at the time. Um, and so as soon as I got into my second trimester and felt better, uh, I left Intel, um, interviewed at a bunch of companies, including Google that made me interview, even though they had been working in my house, <laughs> wanted me to come with a resume and do comprehensive interviews. It has not changed. I went through the same comprehensive interview as everybody else. In fact, mine was probably longer. Um, I Did they put you on hours. the waiting list? No, I was not. Well, <laughs> Well, I had the advantage that I mm -hmm. uh, had their cell um, <laughs> phone numbers. So no, and then um, I joined, even though it had um, it had no revenue, um, and but you know it, it had it had really good technology, and I was you know it really came to me where I was I was actually at work I was at Intel and I was doing my job. And I started, wanted to search something and look it up, and, and then Google was down. And you have to remember, this wasn't the Google that you know. This was a Google, like, stanford.edu slash Google, right? It was some beta version that wasn't very production ready, and it was down. And, and I realized, wow, I've become so used to Google as a tool to get my work done, and the other search engines just are not performing at that same level. And that was really when the light bulb went off for me where I thought, wow, I, I can't do my work. I need this tool. It's making me better at work at Intel. Uh, and if it's going to make my job better, then it's probably going to do that for millions, billions of people. And it probably will become an important company. And that was the moment where I said, you know, I should work with them. Even though they're in my house making a mess, <laughs> I should apply. Were you... <laughs> Take us um, now back to deciding to buy YouTube. You're at Google. You've confidently joined. What made you think you should buy YouTube? So I was working on a product called Google Video. 
and we were very excited. Interestingly, Google Video and YouTube started around the same time, literally with months within each other, and I can say Google Video started first. But um, YouTube made a series of decisions that turned out to be better decisions for the community and for building product. And um, so we initially went from thinking like we had the winning product to thinking we had the losing product because YouTube was a better product than, than what we had for a variety of reasons. And um, so because I was in that space and because I was working with it, I realized a lot, I had a lot of insights that most people didn't have about it. And I would summarize those by first of all saying that you know, we realized that um, people wanted to share their stories. That was the first, um, the first insight. And you know, today we know that we know that people love uploading their stories. They share it. I mean, social media, right? This was before any of that existed. So people didn't necessarily. We didn't really know that the average person want to upload a video and have the whole world see it. Like that had never happened before. And so the closest thing was like. Um, funny home videos. That was the closest thing there was to that. And so we were like, yes, people want that. And then, it, and that kind of makes sense, right? People want to be famous and you know, you can understand there's a whole market for it. But what I think a lot of people didn't understand, particularly a lot of people in entertainment, was that other people want to see average people's videos. Like they want to see videos of people who are not on a set, not productionized, not looking perfect. They want to see average people sharing stories about their lives. And I remember our first hit, which was of these two college students. They're in their dorm room singing to the Backstreet Boys. They were lip syncing to the Backstreet Boys. Their roommate is in the background doing his homework mm -hmm. okay, throughout the entire video. <laughs> and they're in their dorm room, right? And it was just, it was very casual. And you know, today we know that all is as user generated and we know a lot about music and how people love to do mashups and all kinds of things with, with music. But at the time we didn't. And so the fact that I saw those two trends um, and then I made a big assumption, which is that we could serve ads on it, um, and that advertisers would actually want to serve ads there, which took many years for that to realize. Um, but anyway, we wound up, I made that assumption, and I put together a model. By the way, I spent one hour on that model. Um, and That's because Anderson taught you so well that you need it. I was so good at modeling, <laughs> thanks to all of my professors here, that yes, in less than an hour, I produced this model. You have to remember that the company was being sold in less than 24 hours, and that you had to decide to bid or not bid, and how much you were going to bid, and how much you were going to pay. And if you didn't do it that quickly, then you were out. And so I think I spent less than an hour on it. And it was an hour well spent. Though. I was deposed many times on it, and people asked me all kinds of questions, and I kept saying, "Remember, I only spent one hour on this." Um, okay, so you bought YouTube. It was an amazing purchase, but then you didn't become the CEO then. No. But then you did a number of years later. So maybe, yes. maybe tell well, yeah. I, we did a. Uh, I, I, I was managing it, but then they asked me to manage all the ads. And I was sad I was giving away video, which I had been working on. But um, I took, I wound up taking over all of our ads, the development and creation of all of Google's ads products. And so I managed that for. It probably seemed like an important job. <sighs> yeah, it was. An important, I never thought I would work in advertising. Um, that wasn't something I'd anticipated. But it was. An, it was very important. I'm very glad I did it. Knowing how to make money for a company is an essential skill. And <laughs> once you have it, it's really it's a lot easier to get a job. So, um, so, so it was a good background for me, and I, I and really good training. So then you're running Google's ads business. Yes. What made you decide to take the leap a number of years later, maybe 2014 to 20, 2014? Yes. Well, so I was on ads, and um, there was another um, person, his name's Saler Kamengard, who had, was also, he actually joined as employee number nine, and he was my co-conspirator in buying YouTube. And anyway, so he, he was CEO, and he was leaving, retiring, 
And uh, so they had to find a replacement. And I, Larry, to so Larry Page, who's the founder of the company, asked me, what do you think about YouTube? Like, and would you be interested in it? And I knew that the way Larry <coughs> makes decisions, that is, is if you're not really excited at first, that you'll never get another chance at it. So I basically knew I had to decide, right? I couldn't say, well, let me think about it and I'll get back to you tomorrow. Because maybe he would say, well, that's not available anymore. Um, so I just, you know, in my head, I just said like video, video's really big, gonna get even bigger. It would be different than ads. I'd get to meet lots of really interesting people. Like, yes. I'll take it. Um, so I'm it was ready. right there, right in that meeting. No, I was just like, "Yes, I love it. I want. I want it. I want to do that." And I mean, the thing is, I was running ads at the time. I mean, it might seem like an obvious decision now, um, but at the time, I was running our advertising business, which was almost or over fifty billion. Um, YouTube, we don't disclose what it is at the time, but it was a much smaller company, much smaller business it was definitely not 50 billion. Um, it was really small. It was in one building. It was in San Bruno, which is a different part of like the main campus. And so it wasn't necessarily obvious that that was like that that was a better thing to do. But I had been on ads for many years, I mean, over a decade. And I was excited to do something consumer. I was excited to have the cross-functional like CEO opportunity and so I immediately took it and um, it was um, an incredible experience. I'm so honored I did it, but I was busy every single day for the next nine years yeah. not working on YouTube. Well, maybe let's dig into some of those things that you were busy with. Tell us about working with creators. Well, so creators, of course, are core to YouTube. and. Like that was actually the one thing I remembered from the, you know, when I did a, a very short transition with the other CEO, the only thing he really talked to me about were creators. Like you have to have to focus on creators. And you t creators, um, you know, you probably all know various creators. And if you don't, your kids certainly <laughs> can list 20 that they would love to meet. Um, and creators, creators is what have grown up on YouTube. Creators are next generation. Um, media companies. They are people who have. They are people who have decided. Um, oftentimes, they have turned away traditional media offers to build their own companies. They're global brands, and they're doing incredibly well. Focused on all kinds of different topics, um, from entertainment to hobbies to sailing to sports to yoga. Um, like whether it's Adrian. Um, on yoga, mm -hmm. or Mr. Beast, who you may have heard of, who's you know, one of our biggest creators. Um, it was really, it was wonderful to work with them all, um, but it was also, when you run a media company, like if you ran something like Disney or ABC, like, or you know, NBC, you, you, you buy content and you produce it. You buy the script, you hire the people, and they all work for you, and you make decisions, and they presumably do what you, you know, have asked them to do or hired them to do. When you run YouTube, you have all these creators that are all their own company. They can decide to leave you at any time. And all of them have millions, if not tens of millions of followers on Twitter. So if you do anything that they don't like, you're going to hear about it um, really quickly. And so that pre presented a lot of challenges of making sure that we everything we did we leaned into creators because creators were so core to YouTube. And you know, sometimes there were moments that were hard where we had to make a decision that maybe creators didn't necessarily agree with because they didn't see all of the statistics that we saw. Um, or it would be a decision that we would have to make to make sure that the ecosystem stayed healthy, like enabling younger, newer creators. You have to keep you know, new creators and balancing how all the different types of creators on the system. So, that was um, that was you know definitely one of the joys of of uh, that I enjoyed getting to know all the creators, meet with them, all these independent businesses, and see them all grow into companies that had millions. You know, a lot of times we're producing millions of dollars. Yeah, it's so cool to meet creators. Um, one challenge for creators, and probably something that a lot of the people in the room have heard a lot about, 
is content moderation. And this is like keeping, deciding which videos get to stay up, which videos get to stay down. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? How did you handle that? <coughs> So the, the content creation, the content moderation was probably one of the hardest things that I have ever worked on. And it's not something that I anticipated that I would ever be in the middle of or that I would need to work with. And YouTube has a very strong commitment to responsibility and making sure that what we do is um, that we're taking a, the right long-term view on that. And I always said, I wanna make sure that, you know, when the history books are written, that, that YouTube and the decisions that we made were seen as good decisions, good decisions for society, um, for users, um, and you know, for, the, for the internet, for, the, for overall. And, um, that meant that there were a lot of really hard decisions we had to make in terms of um, creating new policies very quickly. YouTube grew very quickly, and so as a result, um, you know, we saw a lot of bad actors who suddenly started to use the internet in ways that we hadn't anticipated and that hadn't been done before. And so as a result, we had to make a lot of policies. Um, we had to hire um, a lot of people to do that content moderation. We had to build systems to enforce it. Um, and we had to do that with pretty much every tough topic in the world, whether you're talking about um, election integrity, making sure you know kids are safe. Um, we went through the pandemic, all the different issues that people had around um, misinformation, health misinformation. and so. That was an area um, where, you know, ultimately we came up with a number of different policies. We tried very hard to implement them consistently. Um, and when we created those policies, we worked a lot of times with often dozens of different groups, whether they were like on all different sides um, of the political spectrum, as well as uh, many different people who would be impacted. Uh, and then we would have to make sure they could be implemented by the thousands of people around the globe and that they could implement that in a consistent format. So that was definitely one of the hardest things I've ever done. And I do feel very confident and very proud that the work that we did was incredibly high quality and high integrity. And uh, yeah, I do believe that's one of the reasons that for the most part, YouTube has been able to stay out of a lot of the news and controversy is because the decisions we made were generally understood by our creator ecosystem um, and were well received. Yeah, I thought it was uh, YouTube really felt like it cared a lot as I was trying to do the right thing. So it was something I was really proud of working there. It was, def it was definitely, uh, um, I mean, there were definitely some really tough times with a lot of work, a lot of hard work by a lot of people um, to get into, uh, you know, to make that happen, myself included, working hard. So that was a, <laughs> that was a theme of YouTube was um, creators, content. Um, now a big trend in technology is generative AI. You mentioned it earlier. Yes. What do you think that is going to mean for YouTube? Yeah. Well, you know, I should also ask you that because um, <laughs> Johanna is <laughs> Johanna knows a lot about this area. Um, Johanna knows a lot about a lot of areas. Let me just say, um, yes, Johanna has worked on search, um, Android, mm -hmm. um, workspace. Mm -hmm. Yep, YouTube, yep. Um, really the core infrastructure of all of the search and discovery systems, which are the heart of YouTube. So anyway, Johanna knows a lot about this, but uh, um, so please so add I'll be on to I'll be, great, I'll be grading her. Please, please <laughs> add on to my answer. Um, I mean, I think ChatGPT, I think a lot of the, what we've seen with a lot of generative AI is the ability to create content so much quicker and easier. And so I think that's really gonna transform the creation tools for people to be able to, create content quickly, easily, for it to be dynamically generated. Um, and that also means that from a responsibility standpoint, we're gonna have to change and update all of our tools to make sure that we have an understanding of what might have been generated that's not necessarily accurate anymore. Um, I also think it gives a lot of opportunities for us to be able to um, 
you know, YouTube is both an entertainment as well as an information platform. And so people come there to learn, but they also come there to be entertained. Um, and so to the extent that they're coming there to learn, I believe there's a lot of, will be a lot of opportunities for us to help them pull the right parts of video or to summarize videos or to find ways for them to better use YouTube um, and you know, ultimately get their answer and information faster and better. Yeah, probably summaries, probably new ways of modality. Like, so a lot of time you'll type in what you want to see on YouTube, but maybe you'll chat with the with YouTube in the future, so it'll be more interactive. It's an interesting time. I mean, people spend a lot of time chatting on YouTube, whether it's in the comments, mm -hmm. um, which is a really big thing. People want to be able to to talk to other people on the platform, other users. They want to with the creators. We have live. Um, so there is a really important social component on YouTube that chat GPT might uh, chat GPT and Bard and all of the Google generative AI technologies will you know, find ways to find ways to innovate with. But I do think the most significant will be creation, that creation as we know it is going to change dramatically. Um, okay, so I'm going to switch gears, I think, for the final question. Final couple of questions are about advice. So what is a good piece of advice that you have received? And maybe then after that, what is some advice you might give to the audience? I think there's probably people from different classes, but what might you, advice be that you would give to um, a younger version of yourself? Yeah. Well, I can tell you the one piece of advice that definitely <laughs> stuck with me, um, which I think has been valuable for me throughout my career. So um, it actually happened with, it was an it was a interaction that I had with Eric Schmidt, who was the CEO of Google for a long time. And it used to be, believe it or not, like before we had a finance team, I used to do the financial forecasts. And I also learned all of that at Anderson. <laughs> um, but <laughs> But I, would, I did the financial forecast, which I thought I did a really good job. If I remember correctly, we went, we went from about 20 million to about 100 million, which in one year, um, that was very an impressive increase for yeah. us. And like, I forecasted it around 100 million. Well, we didn't, if you look at the records, we didn't get to 100 million. We got to like 98 million, something like that. And Eric told me that I made a mistake that I, my forecast was wrong. And I told him, no, the sales team was wrong. Um, <laughs> and he told me, don't be so defensive. And I realized when he said that, I don't know why it just really sunk in that I was being defensive. I didn't have to defend myself so vigorously. I could have just said, yeah, you know, I was off by 2 million, um, and, which was 2%. But anyway, I, 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 think, I, I think one of the things I've learned certainly is, is that as you um, especially become more senior in an organization, you become more accountable for the mistakes and have to be willing to look for how the company is not doing things right. Um, and how the company could do better. And you have to be willing to take the criticism and not deflect it. You have to take the criticism and be able to listen to it and understand, is this something that we really have under control? Is this something that's really a problem? Or is this something that we, you know, is this something that we really should fix? And, and I will say that you know, probably that lesson in some ways really helped me turn the ship when it came to our responsibility. Because our teams initially, internally, probably thought everything was okay. Mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't. There was a lot of things that needed to be fixed. And um, it was really important to hear the feedback, really important to, to make changes. And, and that's your job as a CEO is to call call decisions and make people aware of when something is broken that nobody else thinks is broken. Everyone else th thought it was okay. So for responsibility, like one of the ways I really, I don't know if you remember this, 
I really got everyone's attention was we had this big offsite and everyone was re- out really late that night. And I made everyone come in at eight o'clock in the morning for a meeting <laughs> um, the next morning because I was like, this really matters. It's really important. I want everyone here at 8 a.m. At, in the building. We're all here. We were at a, actually at an offsite in L.A. And I was like, everybody has to show up. And it was it was like people it, it, it part of that came from understanding that you make mistakes and when you make mistakes, you have to own them and you have to be willing to hear them and willing to learn and willing to change. So that's my one piece of advice. Awesome.